Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Now it's good to see you here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church on this beautiful Lord's Day. We welcome every one of you. May the Lord bless you. And you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, most certainly appreciate you tuning in. Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Church here in Athens, Georgia. Now this is Preacher Edward speaking. We're hoping doing the Next hour, we can be an inspiration to every one of you. So you in the radio listening audience, if you get on your phone and call a friend, have them to tune in and get this hour coming up. I appreciate it so very much. If you have your Bible, turn to the book of Revelation chapter 19, the last book in the Bible. I'm reading verses 1 through 9. I'm speaking on the subject, the marriage of the Lamb. This message will be on cassette tape as well as the music and the singing today. And it's available for a gift of $3 or more to help pay for radio time. Now the evil and wicked appeals court, uh, federal court appeals, federal court's done it to us again in this area. They took another man off a death row. These evil judges and the ACLU, America's Crime Loving Union, is out to try to get every man and woman off a death row they possibly can. They're afraid we'll go ahead and do what God said in the book, put these cold-blooded murders to death, and these liberals are determined to try to get them off of death row, and they're working day and night to do so. And many of these evil judges and many evil lawyers, of course, you know they love the criminal far more than the law-abiding citizen because that's why they get their bread and butter. The more laws are broken, the more crime we have, the more business they have. We got our land filled with crooks and evil and wicked men. You do have some judges today that love law-abiding citizens and love to see people abide by the law. You have some lawyers likewise. But the land today is filled with liberals and infidels and God-haters. And they are for the criminal. They don't care about you losing your loved one or how you have to suffer awful shame and humiliation and heartaches and heartbreaks that you have they they could care less about that and they're the ones that constitute these evil federal appeal courts today that's taking men off of the death row that's been sentenced by law-abiding juries to be put to death as god said in this book now you may say preacher edwards what should we the jurors do in a case like that you go ahead and do what you should be done or should be done you sentence a man to death and here comes these evil judges and they take him off of death row well do your duty go ahead and sentence a person to death for cold-blooded murder his blood will be off your hands and these evil and wicked judges that set him free and they say, oh, you and all that crowd, they'll have the blood on their hands, and they'll give an account unto God, and they'll be held responsible for all the crime that's committed by these evil ones. They're set free, and then they'll answer to God for being so unconcerned about the loved ones of the victim and the terrible torture and the death of the victim, and they'll face God for that, give an account unto God in the day of judgment. Now, this situation is going to get worse. They're set out in America today to take off of death row all condemned men to death and women, of course, and as well take out these criminals out of prison and turn them loose. They're, they're just not the real friends, the law-abiding citizens of this country. And you need to be aware of this and told about it over and over again until somebody can do something about it. And you keep this in mind. This has happened twice in our area now in the last two weeks. And it'll be happening again. It's wrong. It's weak. It's ungodly. It's anti-God, anti-Bible, anti-true Americanism. And it's against the law-abiding the law citizens of our land. It's not right. One of these days, something's going to happen. The law-abiding citizens going to rise up. And we may have a war with the criminals in the land. Who knows? God help us. Revelation chapter 19 and after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation, glory, and honor, and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. 
And again they said, uh, Hallelujah, and a smoke rose up forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne and said, Amen, Hallelujah. And a voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God and it reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sins of God. Now I want to speak today pertaining to these verses, pertaining to the marriage of the Lamb. That's coming one of these days, a wedding of all weddings. Now, a wedding is not something to be taken lightly, as many people do today. Much emphasis is placed upon it in Bible times. We find that the marriage of the Lamb is one of the themes that Jesus liked to talk about. That is the marriage of the King and His Son in Matthew 22, verses 1 through 14. In respect to the 10 verses in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus liked to talk about these weddings, these marriages. In fact, He performed His first miracle at a marriage in Cana. When he turned the water into wine, they uh, esteemed marriage very highly in those days. The day is taken too lightly, and that's the trend of the time, as it was the days of Noah, so shall it be. Now we realize that one of these days is coming a marriage, not on this earth, but yonder in heaven, a marriage of all marriages, and that'll be the marriage of the Lamb, when all the emphasis will be placed on the Lamb, and not necessarily the bride. Down here when you have a wedding, we dress up the bride, we make her most beautiful. We write much about her, what she wore, the color of her gown and so forth. And, and there's much written about the marriage down here when you have maybe four. And this marriage of the Lamb should be looked forward to and rejoice in even thinking about it. Because in verse 7 it said, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb is come. That's coming a time when we'll be part of the greatest wedding of all weddings. That time is coming whenever the marriage of the Lamb will take place and be performed by God the Father between the church and the, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The Bible said the wife has made herself ready. Now we make ourselves ready at the Bemar seat of Christ. We are made ready at the Bemar seat of Christ. And I want you to listen closely lest you misunderstand some things I'll be saying in the next few moments from the scriptures. At the great judgment seat of Christ will be the time when all wrinkles will be ironed out. When all differences will be ironed out. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 27, the Bible said he might present it to himself a glorious judge not having spot or wrinkle in such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. At the judgment seat of Christ, God's going to iron out all the wrinkles and clean away all the spots, as it were, from his church. He wants it presented to him without spot or wrinkle. And that time is coming. Now, all things are not ironed out down here. We are saved, we are born again, we are washed in the blood of the Lamb, but we differ on some things down here. You have some saved people that say, you can be saved today and lost tomorrow. You have other saved people that say you're saved today and you can never be lost. And you can never get them to agree. Now there must come a time when they must agree. And we have these differences down here on various things. We may uh, agree on uh, fundamentals like the blood and, and the um, infallibility of the Bible and the deity of Christ and many other things. But there may be some things that we don't see eye to eye and we're just not going to give in. And agree that we are wrong and the other person's right. Now, somewhere along the way, this has to be straightened out. And this will be taken care of at the BMR seat, the judgment seat of Christ. God wants his bride without spot or wrinkle when that bride is presented to his son for the marriage. Now, we expouse to him, we engage to him, as it were. And the Bible said this will be where all unconfessed sins, according to the Bible, 
all things will be cleared up. You know that you've done wrong. You've been wrong. You'll have to, you will confess that. You'll say, I, I have been wrong. You may say, Preach Edwards, do you have any Bible for it? I surely do. In Romans chapter 14, verses 10 through 12. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us, every one of us, talking about God's people here, now not sinners, every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. When we bow before God at the judgment seat of Christ, everything will be cleaned up and confessed and ironed out and done away with. And we'll stand before him as being washed and ironed out and ready for the wedding. Follow me closely and you'll see what I'm trying to get across to you. There may be a saved person out here. He's been born again. He backslid on God. And he hasn't really got back into fellowship like he should have. And then... Uh, he gets killed. Now when he comes to the judgment seat of Christ, he's going to be sorry about the way he's acted and he's going to confess to God that he's sorry about that. And everything must be ironed out. And he'll suffer for it. There'll be a great loss because of it in regard to his reward on the other side. But all these things must be ironed out and they will be ironed out. What's not straightened out here? I'm not talking about the redemption of the soul. I'm talking about the deeds of the individual and our acts and our deeds and what we do down here and our sins and so forth. Beloved, if we don't have everything straightened out here, it'll most certainly have to be straightened out at the judgment seat of Christ. We are not going to the marriage supper fussing and quarreling and disagreeing with one another and conjuring something up in our hearts and minds that shouldn't be there. All of that going to be ironed out and straightened out at the BMR seat of Christ. And then the bride will be dressed in her own righteousness. Now don't you misunderstand me and don't you leave here today and you in the radio listening audience, don't you go out and say preach Edwards is preaching a man can have a second chance. I don't believe that. I don't believe in purgatory. That's a doctrine of hell. That's not in the Bible. No such thing as purgatory. No such thing as having a second chance to be saved. Right. I'm talking about getting things straightened out among God's people. Now in verse 8, look at this verse. I read it in your hearing in my text. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen and clean and white. For the linen, fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Yeah. Now this is not God's divine imputed righteousness he's talking about here. He's talking about the righteousness of the saints. Now when you're saved, there's imputed unto you God's divine righteousness. And God sees you in Christ as though you'd never sin or ever will. But there is right things, a righteousness of the saints. And you determine yourself the kind of clothes you're going to wear as it were. You're weaving your own uh, gown that you'll be wearing or weaving of your own, uh, the Bible tells us here, uh, clothing, the, the fine linen to her was granted she should be arrayed in fine linen. We're weaving that to a certain extent down here. As to how we're going to look in his sight at the judgment seat of Christ pertaining to us and our works and our deeds. Not our redemption for salvation. I'm not talking about that at all. That's why we have the judgment seat of Christ. That's why it'll be there. God will look at us. He'll see what we have done. What kind of fine linen we've woven down here. What kind of garment we have on. When we stand before him in the way of the good deeds we have done. Having nothing to do with salvation. Now you be sure you don't misunderstand this preacher. Now we, what we're doing here. We're doing this about our, our wedding dress. And we're going to wear there. That is God's getting us ready. God's going to wash out the old spots. And iron out old wrinkles. And straighten up the wedding garments. And get everything ready. But you determine now. The righteousness of the saints. Your own righteousness. Your good works. Your good deeds. That you will be wearing at the judgment seat of Christ. And then when you stand at the judgment seat of Christ. Standing there clothed in what you have done. In the way of good works. Determine your rewards and so forth. God will straighten out all things. And straighten out the crooked. And clean up the spot. And iron out the wrinkles. And get everything squared away. 
but it behooves you and I to be sure that we have woven a good linen garment down here that when we stand before him, we won't bow our heads in shame. Now you must keep that in mind. That has nothing to do with your soul salvation. Salvation is a gift from God. I'm talking primarily about your rewards, your efforts, your good deeds. And if you notice very close, it said here that to her was granted she should be arrayed in fine linen and clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Not God's divine imputed righteousness. This is the righteousness of the saints that you're going to stand there in at the judgment seat of Christ to see what you have done down here upon the earth. And then at the wedding, there will be guests there. Now, who are these guests? In verse 9, And he saith unto me, Right blessed are they which are called in the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, after we leave the Bemar seat, and all differences have been straightened out, all crooked places have been straightened out, all wrinkles have been ironed out, everything squared away, cleaned up, and set straight, and our reward is determined... Then we're going to move from there to the marriage supper. We find over in the Song of Solomon a beautiful type. In the Song of Solomon there you have a type of Christ and the, and the bride. And a very beautiful story we find there about a little maiden of Shulam that lived in a little town in Galilee about five miles from Mount Tabor. And she had kept the vineyard, even her own brothers made light of her. Others caused the problems. Uh, but she kept the vineyard out there and kept not her own vineyard. And she was taken by Solomon and brought to Lebanon. And no doubt Lebanon, no doubt then Lebanon, Solomon, maybe she was a beautiful girl and he tried to entice her to himself, maybe offered uh, wealth and so forth, but she refused. The reason she refused, that was a little shepherd boy that she had met and fallen in love with. And she'd think about him every night. She'd dream about him. She could imagine herself walking up and down the streets there, knocking on doors, see if she could find him. Is my lover here? She was longing for that young shepherd boy. And she was waiting for him. She was trying to find him. She loved him with all of her heart. In spite of all the enticement from Solomon, with his wealth, his popularity, she did not yield. And then one day she came in contact with her lover. And arm in arm they skipped across the, the beautiful garden. That because she had met her lover and they were united. Now that's a picture of the church of Jesus Christ. Down here we're enticed by the world, by wealth, by popularity, by various other things. But you know this one we're looking for. He's our lover. We love him. Having never seen him like Brother Brock mentioned in the scripture he quoted here this morning. By the way, he quoted all the scripture you heard out in the radio listening audience. He has the word of God on the inside of him. He wasn't reading that. He was quoting that. All people ought to memorize the scriptures that love God. And then so he quoted that scripture. Having not seen Jesus, we love him. We have never seen him. We love him. And one of these days we will see him. And so she met her young lover, the shepherd boy. But she did not yield the temptation of the world, not even from Solomon. And God still has some people down here today that will not be allured or tempted or dragged away by the offer of the world and what the world has to give, even fame or popularity, even wealth. They still love the Lord Jesus. They're going to put him first in their lives. Would to God we had more people today to put Jesus first in their lives and not just let every little insignificant something that comes along hinder them and cause them not to love God as they should and to be careless in serving God. If we as one half are uh, concerned about loving God and serving God and the things of God as we were about people around us, our own relatives and neighbors and so forth, and our jobs and whatnot, we'd have revival before sundown. But people just don't love God like they should. They let any little thing that comes along hinder them. Now we have many beautiful types in the Old Testament of this great marriage. That's the entire message involving the type between um, Isaac and Rebecca. Beautiful story there. And you know it very well, I'm sure. Isaac there was the son of a miracle, more or less, given to Abraham and Sarah. And later on when he became of age and time for him to get married, 
Abraham said to his servant Eleazar, who is a type of the Holy Spirit, his name is not given, and that's, we believe he was Eleazar because the Holy Spirit doesn't speak of himself. He brags on Jesus. And so he's an unnamed servant. And Abraham says to his unnamed servant, I want you to go and go back to our people and find a bride for my son Isaac. Now this man was Abraham's right hand man. He was in charge of everything he had. He knew the heartbeat of Abraham. He knew the desire of Abraham. He knew Isaac quite well, of course. Very well acquainted with the family. And so he set out on a mission to go and find a bride for Abraham's son Isaac. He goes across the desert. He moves on the way. And uh, we find that he moves on to a certain land. The Bible tells us about He went to the land of Nahar, which signifies the snowing of a sleeping man. You find that in Genesis chapter 24 and verse 10. And so he went to this place there to find a bride for his master's son Isaac. And the word of God plainly tells us what takes place there. Now he's very much concerned about it. He's, he wants to pray about it. And so he wants to be sure he gets the right person. He's very powerful. In Genesis chapter 24 verse 11 and 12, he, he goes to this certain area. He realizes he's, he's in the right to reign the right place there for to find the bride for Isaac. He's in the area, of course, but he doesn't know who the woman is. And he's got to find out the right one. He wants to be dead sure. And so he gets down on his knees, no doubt, and he prays about it. The Bible says in Genesis 24 and verse 11 and 12, he made the camels to kneel without the city by the well of water at the time of the evening. Even the time that women go out to draw water, he said, O oh Lord God of my father Abraham, I pray thee, send me good speed this day and show kindness unto my master Abraham. So he lets his camels kneel down upon their knees. No doubt he got on his knees and he began to pray. And he said, uh, God, I came to get a son, a bride rather for your, for the son of Abraham, my master, son, the son named Isaac. He wanted to be sure that he got the right when he stopped at the well, which is symbolic of salvation. He wants to be sure he gets the right one. And then he, he told God, said, now when a certain person does a certain thing, if, that, if she does that, then she would be the right one. I won't go into the detail, take too much time. But it wasn't long then until Rebecca comes to the well. And, and not only did she offer him water, but she offered to draw water for the camel. So... That was it. That was what enticed him, made him realize that she was possibly the very what he's looking for. And he gives her some earrings and bracelets. Earrings which speaks of faith by hearing. Bracelets which speaks of service for God after we hear the word of God and saved. And then he introduced himself, told her about his errand. And then she ran and told her people about it. Verse 28, and the damsel ran and told them of her mother and the house about these things. Now Ezar presents them, uh, presents her in particular, and them with many gifts. He's a type of the Holy Spirit in John chapter 16, verses 13 to 14. You will find there the Holy Spirit has gifts for the people of God, gifts for the bride of Christ to be, gifts that God wants us to have. And they're available if we're willing to pray and ask God to help us to be more used of Him and more faithful. And if we're faithful over a few things, then of course he'll give us more to do for him. And then he talked to Rebecca, told about what was happening and why he came and about Abraham, his master, and Isaac, heir to his wealth and how he was a wealthy man. He came to secure this, this bride for Isaac and sold her, sold her on Isaac and she'd never seen him. That's exactly what the Spirit of God does today. He begins to prick the heart of that sinner disturbs that sinner and that sinner repents and receives Christ and the Spirit of God really sells that sin on Jesus having never seen the Lord we fall in love with Jesus now sinners don't love God the love of God said brought in your heart by the Holy Ghost no sinner loves God Amen. that's not a sinner living today that loves God not a one 
You can only love God through the shedding abroad of the Holy Ghost in your hearts. But when you get saved, you begin to love God, and the Spirit of God brings that about. Now, he asked Rebecca, would you be willing now to go back and meet this young man Isaac and his father Abraham and become his bride? And she said, yes, I'm willing to go. He said, will you go? She said, yes, I will go. Now, God is not going to save any sinner against his will. Now, God will make you willing. You'll have to become willing to be saved and want to be saved or you'll not be saved. And so she said, I'm willing, I'm glad to go, I'm willing to go. And so they started on their journey. She was to go with a person she had never met before. When you get saved, you have a person you're going along with you've never met before. He's the Holy Spirit. He's your guide and your teacher. Never met him before until he began to entice you to come to God and convict you. She was asked to marry a man she had never seen. Now, one of these days, we're going to marry a man we have never seen. We're the bride. Christ is the bridegroom. We've been betrothed to him. And one of these days, the wedding will take place, and we have never seen him. And, but we'll marry him one day. And the scripture that Brother Brock gave, it said, Whom it have not seen, you loved. And whom, though you now you see him not yet, believing, you rejoice with joy and speak with full of glory. We haven't seen him, but we love him. And one of these days, we'll be married to him we sit down at the marriage supper now she said i'll go and she's guided safely across the desert eliezer knows the way back he comes from that country and he knows the way back and he guides her safely which is the type of the church across the desert the holy ghost came from heaven and he knows the way back and he's now gotten the church since the day of pentecost until we see our isaac He's gotten us safely across the desert. Amen. He knows the way. He's been there. He's come here. He'll take us back. Amen. He knows the way back. And then in, she meets Isaac in the field. She sees this man coming. She lights off a camel. She puts on a veil. She goes out to meet the most handsome man she's ever laid eyes on. When he raises that veil, he sees the most beautiful woman that he's ever seen in his life. He sees the very woman he'd been dreaming about from boyhood. And she sees a handsome man that she's dreamed about from a little girl because God put them together. Amen. And that's where it'll be between Christ and the church. And then she meets him in the field. And one of these days, our great Isaac shall come in the air. And then we, Rebecca, will meet him in the air. We're going back into Sarah's tent. We're going back to be my seat of Christ. At the BMR seat of Christ, all problems behind out. We'll be rewarded according to our deeds on the earth. After all of that is solved, everything is taken care of. We're going to move down to the marriage supper where the marriage will take place. God will marry us to his son, Jesus Christ. And then after the marriage, we're going to sit down at the marriage supper. And what a supper that will be. And after that supper, we're going into Sarah's tent. The Bible said Isaac here took Rebekah into Sarah's tent. Sarah had died. Now Sarah's tent today is Israel. We're coming back to the land of Israel. That's Sarah's tent. And we're going there on our honeymoon. After marriage supper, the Lord Jesus Christ will say, Now it's time for the honeymoon. He takes his bride and we sail away with his bride. In Revelation 19, we're coming back as a great army. And we're coming back to Sarah's tent, the great land of Israel. And for 1,000 years, we're going to enjoy a honeymoon. There was Jesus Christ, the bridegroom. Amen. We're the bride, and he's the bridegroom. And we've spent a 1,000-year honeymoon period there with our dear Lord. After the honeymoon, then he's going to take us into our final abode. He's going to raise the curtain in the age. And when he raises that curtain, that's going to appear one of the most beautiful cities man's ever laid his eyes on. A city of pure gold. Streets of pure gold. Gates of pearl. Beautiful water of life. The river of life. 
fruit on either side. And that city will be 1,500 miles long, 1,500 miles wide, 1,500 miles high. And our bridegroom is going to say to his bride, we the church, this is a home I provided for you. The honeymoon is over. We're going to move in. And this is where we'll live. Hallelujah. That ought to make a Presbyterian shout. And that'll be our eternal home forever in the beautiful golden city of God. Thank God for redemption. If you're not saved today, you ought to get saved. Tomorrow could be too late. You could miss out on all the great things that God has in store for us. Let us stand to our feet. You've listened well. Our Father, I pray today you'll take the message on the marriage supper of the Lamb and that you'll use it to thy glory, that you speak to the hearts of thy people, that you prick the heart of some lost sinner, that he might come to know thee before it's everlasting too late. May somebody today in the radio listen audience come to know thee and bless every Christian that heard the message today. Do something for him, Father, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Debbie's going to play for us on this instrument as she plays. If you're in this building unsaved, if you're here backslidden on God, if you're here and you want to join this church the way we receive members, if there's any other reason that you want to come forward, you may. Would you come while she plays and while we wait? While Christians pray, would you come? Do you need a good old-fashioned fundamental Bible-believing church home, do you? Do you need the Savior? Do you need to get back in fellowship? Do you need to come forward for any reason? Would you come at this time? I wish you would. You'll never be sorry. How about it now while we wait? You and you alone know whether God's been speaking to your heart. I don't know. I just brought the message I felt God wanted me to bring. 